and we were going to start a new series on the suffering servant. And um, I, I gave a little clue as to what we will be talking about, but I think it's kind of important to uh, discuss a bit about uh, what I mean by the suffering servant. Um, this series, I can't tell you how long it, uh, we will be engaging in this dialogue, uh, but let's just go on this journey with the Lord as long as he desires, and we'll talk about it until he's done talking about it, maybe a couple weeks, okay? Um, but it is a topic um, that I, I, I want to talk about because as believers, uh, I believe that we have uh, probably in our hearts pondered about this, but we've never truly gotten answers. So we have um, this topic about suffering on our hearts. Why do we suffer? All the various questions we'll explore throughout this series. I just think that um, we have not really uh, gotten the true answers or gotten enough answers about suffering. And in fact, um, this is a bit of a hard word uh, to share, but I truly believe that this is from the heart um, of our Savior. And um, just to begin, I, I think as a church that we have done a poor job, a poor job uh, of representing the truth about what salvation and suffering looks like. In an effort, I think, to win the lost, we've presented our Lord as our servant, that he serves our, us, he serves our needs, more than the reality of us yielding to his purposes and to his plans. And the reality is that we actually serve the Lord. He does not serve us. But our evangelism infomercials, so when we're out witnessing, they sound more like, uh, I imagine this like old TV set and we're on this um, scene of an old car commercial. And I imagine this person in an old khaki suit and they're like, you know, come on down, come on to the Lord. Uh, come to him today. He loves you. And he's just waiting to load you up with all these wonderful new blessings why I got a new car and a new house when I gave him my life. Those are the kind of infomercials that we sell about salvation, that that's what it's about to be a Christian, that, that life's going to be so much sweeter. And, and there is certainly an advantage. Don't let me take that away. But we sell the sweet things, the blessings, and we fail to give the full picture of what this life looks like. Uh, we paint the picture as if, uh, Christ is like Santa Claus and that he's simply waiting to load us up with our list of goodies if we're nice and we're not naughty. We pray to him like he is our servant or he's our genie. We tell him what we want and we tell him how we want things to go. And when he doesn't give us what we want, we're mad at him. We are spoiled, rotten, and we have been producing generations, reproducing generations of spoiled, rotten babes in Christ that kick and scream when they don't get their way. Us, the church, the body of Christ, we have be, been pumping out generations of spoiled, rotten babies. And they never truly are enabled or equipped with what they need to know about the Lord to be sound, mature servants of the Most High. And if we're honest and we, we really look at what salvation and sanctification means, this is not what it means. We're not in relationship with Christ to get what we want out of him. We've been called... Uh, to purposes and to the plans of God in this earth. And he has given us an assignment to fulfill, to, to continue the work of Christ that he began on the earth. He's waiting on us. Christ is waiting on his church to take their rightful place. 
He does not need to be our Santa Claus. Jesus is not our Santa Claus waiting to give us what we need. He has already, scripture says, first Peter, excuse me, second Peter, one and three, he has already given us everything that we need, we could ever need in him. All things that are per pertaining to life and godliness, he has given us by his divine power. So, what happens? We come to Christ and we begin this journey with him, right? We learn this new way of life. We're excited. Um, we're in church. We're pumped. Uh, the church kind of gives us, by a prayer, prayer, uh, praise and worship gives us this, this new uh, vocabulary, this new dialogue, how we profess we're committed to you. We're in love with you. Uh, my mom was telling me about this song today. Um, my life is not my own. To you, I belong. I, I give myself away. I give myself my, my desires, my motives. I give them all to you, right? Christ is adored in the newness. There's a zeal about him. We're in love with him. Like um, little teenagers that are in love with this new lover. We have this new boyfriend, this, this person that we're excited about talking to. Um, we have these new possibilities about our life with him. Uh, we're experiencing his joy, his peace, his freedom. Nothing happens. Some sort of disappointment, some sort of trouble, some sort of pain, some sort of suffering occurs. And then this new believer and many, many of us that are not new believers, we look at our love, our newfound love, our Christ, our, our lover of our soul, and we can't help but feel some type of tension and some inconsistencies in the way that we were um, presented Jesus and what we are actually seeing take place in our life. And as a church, I put the responsibility back on us that we have to do I think a better uh, job, even with discipleship, because that's discipleship. We work very hard as a church on our conversion process. How do we get them in? We bring them in with gas cars, with bouncy castles. We'll feed them. We will, you know, we'll flare and lights. We'll bring them in, smoke, um, loud music, dim the lights. You know, we've got this fanfare to bring them in, but then we lose them after that because we do not equip them with what, with what it looks like to walk with and actually follow Christ. They come to our church, they, they try Christ, they give him their life, but then they're lost concerning what to do next. What does life as a believer look like for me now? They need more than a ritual or reminder of the day that our services are being they need somebody to walk with them. They need somebody, they need what we call discipleship. They can't do it on their own. They need discipleship. And I would actually venture to say it's not just new believers. We all need discipleship and we need to maintain some sort of discipleship. What is discipleship? Being made followers of Jesus Christ. Are we not all followers? We need something to keep us following Jesus Christ. We have people even who have been in the faith almost all of their lives and they have not been equipped with what they need to know to follow Christ. I believe that we have been selling an image of Christ that is lacking truth. We've been selling an image of Christianity that says, when you come to Christ, everything will be better. You'll never experience evil anymore. Jesus will protect you from that big bad devil. But the only thing that we all in this big world share is the reality of pain and of suffering. And in fact, as soon as you come to Christ or as soon as you experience some depth um, some level of depth and commitment in your relationship with the Lord, our enemy is coming to test. And we will explore this further in the series to test what you say. If we've been in worship and we're saying, I give myself away, my life is not my own, I, I throw away 
you know, all of my hopes, all of my dreams, I lay them at your feet. The enemy is coming to test those words to see if you really mean in your heart what you say you mean. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your gender, your social status. Everyone will at some point and many times over experience deep turmoil, deep grief, deep grief, deep pain, deep suffering. And we know this, but I feel like in the church, we don't communicate this. And in a, in a way, we, we, we go on with these lofty ideas, but we all will experience some type of suffering. Bible says, uh, Job 14 and 1, certainly he knew trouble. He knew suffering. Job said, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. We have few days and those few days are full of trouble. Suffering is actually at the heart of the Christian story. I've been told, uh, what is the wording? Um, that this is, salvation is a suffering way. Salvation is a suffering way. It's not an easy street. When people come looking for answers to make sense of suffering, I feel like in the church, we, we, we don't do a good job of giving them reality. We give them, we pass them church cliches to pacify them. We say, and I, and I know this, just because I have a friend who's actually watching right now, I will not say her name, but she is new to, and I hope you don't mind me sharing a bit of your story anonymously. She is back in the church. She's so excited to be back in the church and to be pursuing the Lord. However, she um, shared with me some of the, the suffering that she went through that caused her to walk away from the Lord for, your, for a period of time. And some of these sayings that I'm going to share, these church cliches, are things that she, um, she heard. Bad things happen to good people. How many of you have heard that? Everybody in the world says that, not just church people. God won't give you more than you can handle. And you can fight me on that because I know there's a scripture that talks about um, that he won't tempt you beyond what you're able to bear. But that is not God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not real. Everything happens for a reason. That's another church cliche. Everything happens for a reason. Their sickness, their death was for a reason. And then we, we, we walk through life wondering what was the reason. So then the next cliche we get fed, which is, oh, we'll understand it better in God's timing. Well, when is that? These church cliches that we say, we just, we pass around. We heard it and then we didn't feel like it pacified us, but then someone else comes around and they're trying to vent or they're trying to uh, seek prayer for something that's difficult for them to walk through. And we say the same cold, callous thing. Oh, you'll understand it later. It happens for a reason. It is time that we talk about suffering. Listen, I'm going to be transparent in this. I'm going to be transparent in this series. I have walked through some uh, a very difficult season and for the last six years i have had i struggled to even talk about this series because i ha i said lord i can't talk about this right now because i have some things that i can't reason or make sense of i can't make sense of a suffering a thing that has happened to me i can't make sense of it but i feel like there's so many people that are just simply trying to be faithful, trying to hang into this thing, uh, not feeling it, but putting their clothes on every Sunday, going to church, trying to be faithful, even half-hearted, one foot in the door, one foot out of the door, but they're still, they're still struggling with the topic of suffering. It's time to talk, church, about suffering. We don't discuss the truth about it. 
We don't even discuss that the Bible tells us to expect to suffer or even how to suffer. Did you know that we have examples in the Bible on how to suffer? And then we shame people for complaining and for seeking understanding about suffering. We silence them with scriptures. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Stop complaining. We're not even transparent about our own thoughts on the struggles and the suffering of life. And I feel like we do people a disservice. We're quick to testify about all the good things that happened to us since Christ has come into our life and all the little goodies that Jesus has passed out. But we are not transparent about our suffering and all of the things that God has shielded us from. We have, we've not been transparent about those tough times that the Lord has walked with us and how he taught us to be uh, faithful. He's taught us his faithfulness in the face of suffering. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about, what else don't we talk about? We don't talk about uh, how he maybe didn't give us what we desired, what we wanted, and that we kicked and screamed and we were mad at him, we were upset. But then when we look back years down the road, we were so grateful that he didn't give it to us because he knew what was best for us. When his delay was not denial, when his no was actually um, protection, we don't talk about suffering. We don't talk about those things in the church. And if our, if our lives, if we are to be living epistles read of men, we need to read both testimonies. We need to read the good and what we call the bad. Without a true view of what it's like to walk with the Lord through sun and rain, or even know that sunny and rainy times are a normal part of life, I feel like the believer um, will appear to always live like they're on cloud nine with Jesus, free from trouble. But that's not reality. Sometimes we walk through valleys with Jesus. And yes, King David, sometimes we walk through the valley of the shadow of death with Jesus, knowing that his rod and his staff, that they comfort us. He is our shepherd and we don't have to be afraid. Do we tell people, I know you're going through the valley of death, but you don't have to be afraid? No. The Bible describes how Jesus' suffering actually pleased God. It pleased God for Jesus to suffer. And later it talks about how Jesus, even though he was the son of God, that he learned obedience through the things he suffered. No, it doesn't feel good. Tr trust me. It doesn't feel good. I know it doesn't. But we gain from suffering. And that is how God is pleased. He is pleased when we grow in suffering, when we learn through suffering, when we, um, when we grow in power, when we grow in character, when we grow in obedience in the face of suffering. He is pleased. When we face opposition, in the face of opposition that we take and we maintain our rightful place of authority, our rightful place of victory, no matter what the enemy throws at us and no matter uh, how he tries to defeat us. But without knowing that other believers go through good and bad, victory and suffering, the enemy uses a lopsided view to make us feel like God is sometimes unfair. Has anybody ever thought or felt like God is unfair? 
I'm living all I know. I'm doing all I can. I am committed. And look at this person. And we got to be honest. I, I'm going to be honest and say, I have said many times over that God is unfair. The lopsided view makes us feel like uh, God is blessing everybody else but you. That you're the only one suffering. And this is not true. God is not unfair. You aren't the only one suffering and he has not forgotten about you. He has not forsaken you. He is using even those challenges, those sufferings, those things that we can't vacillate, we can't wrap our mind around, we can't understand the why to perfect his purpose in your life. The Bible says, uh, Matthew 5 and 45, it says, he causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We all share in the natural things of life. We are spiritual beings when we are born again believers in a natural world. We share in both the sun, we share in the rain, we share in the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, the pain, the triumph, the grief. We all share that thing in common. Jesus was making the point that we all experience the same circumstances at different places in our life. Remember, um, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, a time, a time for uh, laughter, a time for, for to cry, a time um, to live, a time to die. I'm rhyming here. But it, there's a time for everything. But as children of God, what is the difference? The difference is that we should be, uh, we should be different than, what, than the rest of the world when we go through circumstances why? Because with Christ, we have hope. It doesn't end there. I lost this, but that is our story. But the enemy would have us so, so focused on, I lost. Look at Job. We'll talk about Job too. He lost, but if you follow to the end of the story. So instead of truly having this discussion, I feel like we leave people um, with all that they can muster up to make sense of suffering. And we're in a, we know we're in a world and in a culture of depression. We know that the enemy is still speaking. The serpent is still trying to speak to us, to deceive us. And so we say things like, okay, God, why didn't you tell me this was going to happen? Why didn't you stop this from happening? I thought you loved me. I thought you were all powerful. How could you do this? What, what did I do to deserve this? Where were you? And as Satan, the coward, throws blows at us and attacks us and then hides his hand, throwing rocks and hiding his hand, he points the finger of accusation at Jesus and so do we. I just really feel like Jesus gets a bad rep. He gets everything. Why did you let this person die? Why did you let this person get cancer? Why did you let me lose? And I'm, I'm all in my stuff. Why did my marriage end? Why, what, what did I do? Why? We, we, we blame him for everything. When all is well, we want everything to do with him. But when the enemy begins opposing us, we turn on, not the enemy, we turn on Jesus and we want nothing to do with him. And if you've ever, are, if you are honest enough and you have ever been in that place, you will know or recall that there's a sort of um, a separated coldness, a, a, almost like a, a coldness that covers over your heart. And you say you're still a believer, you say you're still in relationship with him, 
but your pursuit is not the same. It's not as intense. Your, your grasp on him, your hold on him is not as tight because our innocence has been stolen from the deceiver, from the serpent. We've been knocked off our cloud nine. We've listened to the voice of, of Satan <clears throat> again, and we now see our spotless savior that we once just adored and were infatuated with through disappointed eyes because we feel he didn't do what we thought he should. We, we feel like he failed us, that he didn't protect us from this world. So I feel like there's some wrestling <clears throat> going on in the body of Christ. You know, I had a discussion just yesterday with a couple sisters um, in the Lord. And one of them said to me, um, she described this as conditional love. And I couldn't agree more. The Lord has unconditional love for us. No matter where we are, no matter where our shortcomings fall or arise, no matter where we fall, he still loves us and is always in, I said this before, hot pursuit of us. But the first problem is that we have conditions. He doesn't have conditions. We have conditions when it comes to our love for the Lord. And as soon as he fails to meet our conditions, we're quick to just turn our love off, to turn our commitment off. There's so many inner questions um, reconciled in this series when it comes to suffering. So many questions I've heard people say, if God is good, why does he allow suffering? If there is a God, why does he allow suffering? Uh, if he's all powerful, why can't he stop what the enemy does? Why do we... Um, why do good things, I said that again earlier, happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, why do the righteous suffer? Does suffering mean I've done something wrong? Am I being punished? There's so many questions, so many angles to approach the topic of suffering. And it's going to take us a little time to wrestle with these things, but it's time to talk about them. So, We'll stretch it out again and we'll deal with this from week to week. And it's my prayer, first off, that you just hear the heart of Christ, okay? And that it replaces those church cliches that, that have been stuffed down your throat. Jesus wants you to hear his heart on the subject of suffering and to speak to your heart concerning the things that you've carried even against him. It's not popular to talk about this, but it's so necessary because it directly affects our heart and any valuable relationship that we could ever have with the Lord. In an effort to truly know about him and have a greater relationship with him. Let's journey together to have this discussion with Jesus. <clears throat> and I wanted to lay some foundation today about where we are as the church when it comes to the topic of suffering. But this week, I just briefly want to address the elephant in the room. Let's talk about and get free from the offense that we have in our heart against Jesus because of the things that we have endured. We can say we have nothing against him, but his heart says so different. <clears throat> Let me first say that coming to Christ does not mean freedom from trouble, freedom from pain, freedom from suffering in life. Jesus came to save us from the penalty of death and damnation, eternal damnation. That's the penalty that sin demands. And he's, he laid his life down. He did that work. What he did not come for <clears throat> was to put us in a protective bubble 
of bliss where nothing happens to you or to give us um, a privilege that causes us to escape difficulty. He did not come for that. The interesting thing <clears throat> about me saying that is that many of us will say, oh, yeah, I knew that. But if we would honestly check the condition of our heart, every time trouble, pain, and suffering occurs in our life, our heart communicates something completely different. I would even dare to say in our hearts that we treat the Lord like he betrayed us by not shielding us from trouble, by not shielding us from pain and suffering. How do I know? Because I've done this many times over. I've said this many times over. I've had to repent to the Lord for blaming him for things that someone else has free will to choose to do to me or not to do. I've had to repent to the Lord for blaming him for the actions of someone else. Even when the Lord was warning them not to do it. Now, I know out of my mouth, God, I blame you. But the Lord knows the conversations that we stuff deep in our heart. And it grieves him that we truly do not know his character. That we walk with him for almost our whole lives, many of us. That we've been in the church, we've been around the church, we've heard, we've read uh, things about him, we've heard scriptures, we've heard about him, and we do not know his true character. I blamed him. Transparent moment. I blamed him for allowing my two miscarriages. I blamed him for not protecting me when people took advantage of me. I blamed him for my divorce. God, I did all these things. I interceded. I poured oil uh, in their shoes. I poured oil on their pillow. And still this happened. I blamed God for my divorce. I blamed him for so many things that he gets blamed for every single day. And when others rejected me, I believed the lie that maybe he had rejected me. So can we just, on this talk, take a, a moment, take this time to get free from the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy sow seeds of doubt. When we suffer, <clears throat> we are susceptible to the lies uh, that the enemy whispers in our ears. And the purpose to sow those seeds of doubt in our heart and in our ears when we is to do it when we feel the most uh the most afraid when we're the weakest and we're reaching we're searching for some kind of help some kind of hope and the enemy whispers some seed of doubt he seeks to uh make us doubt the goodness the love the presence and the power of god this type of doubt is seeks to draw conclusions that because of your circumstances that God is not good. And therefore, if he's not good, he's not worthy of our trust. He's not worthy of our life. He's not worthy of us surrendering or surrendering fully to him. It's to bring God into the courtroom of our judgment and determine that he is unfaithful that he is unloving, that he is uncaring in some, some way. To bring us into the, to this court of judgment to say that we are defeated, that we are not who we once believed that we were. We are not the head, but we are the tail. But the enemy is a liar. God is the same God through suffering that he has been to you in times of rejoicing. 
circumstances that take place in our life do not change who he is. He is the same yesterday, today, forevermore. He is a God that changes not. So stop allowing the enemy and Job's friends to lie to you. The Lord is not narcissistic. He's not hung up on himself. He's not cruel. He's not out to ruin you. He's not playing a game with your life. Suffering, what is suffering? Suffering is the state of undergoing some type of pain, some type of distress, some type of hardship. And it's actually, suffering is not <clears throat> a state. Suffering is just our response to what's going on around us. What's going on around us? I'm glad you asked. In most cases, especially for the believer, <clears throat> not all cases, but in most cases, for a born-again believer, what's going on around them is opposition, which is why new believers start to experience that, um, that being knocked off cloud nine. Because the enemy's trying to, before they grow roots, they're, he's trying to knock them off and, and twist what they know and what they've been uh, taught or what they're learning about who Christ is in their life. It is opposition going on around you. Opposition, what is that? It's resistance. It's, uh, it's hostility from the enemy. It's antagonism. It's objection. It's defiance. The enemy is opposing you. And we are in a real world with a real enemy. War is not fair. War is not a vacation. War is not peace. War is bloody. You, once you become a believer, once the Lord has his hand on you and he's in pursuit of you, even if you aren't living fully, you're not living right, you're not righteous, if the Lord has his hand on you, the, you are a threat to the enemy. You could potentially be a threat to the enemy. And he is opposing you. He's trying to turn what you think, turn what you believe in your heart. In the middle of suffering, um, what you're doing is you're actually engaging in spiritual warfare. How? The enemy is attacking your faith in God. In the most in, in life, in the midst of life's most painful experiences. Who's talking usually? Okay, I'll be transparent again. The enemy. This is why people start to uh, commit suicide, just to cut off the voices, just to stop all that chatter because life's already painful and to hear somebody opposing you, these, these enemies opposing you. He comes at, at life's most crucial experiences and his core attack against you in suffering is actually attack against your heart. He's not after your body. What's he going to do with a body? He's not after your relationship. What's the devil going to do with the relationship? He can't have your man. He's not against your possessions. What's he going to do with your couch? What's he going to do with your car? What's he going to do with your house? He's not after your circumstances. Although he may be attacking in those places, he is after your heart. He's seeking for you to turn your heart against God. This is why uh, scripture tells us to guard our heart. For out of it flows, the, the original Hebrew says, um, the, the, the springs of life. I like a couple other translations that say, uh, more than anything else, watch, keep watch over your heart, since here is the well, are the well springs of life. Uh, or New Living Translation, I like that one. Above all else, guard your heart, for it affects everything you do. Did you know that? Your heart affects 
everything you do, you do. And if the enemy can successfully turn your heart against God, it will affect everything you do. So can we just get free and deal with the elephant in the room? Can we today, and you don't have to do it with me, I'm going to do it, but can we, you can do it in your private time, can we today just repent? No, join me. Can we repent for the times that we have blamed God in the face of our suffering? Can we repent for not being transparent with others and sharing our experiences of Christ through good and through bad, through victory and triumph and through suffering. I know, I know we like to be all private and stuff and keep people out of our business, but the Bible says that we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony causes other people to overcome in areas that they may not have overcome before, before hearing your testimony. Can we repent for joining in with the accuser, with Satan, in turning our hearts away from God and from our Savior when we did not get our way? Can we repent for being spoiled, rotten? Because the Lord is truly grieved that we've allowed the enemy to successfully sow seeds of doubt in our hearts that have caused us to stagger in our relationship and in our trust in God. So Lord, forgive us. Thank you for speaking to us your heart and revealing your heart on the matter. But Lord, forgive us for being so tossed in our emotions and weaknesses that we decided not to trust that you are consistent and that you do not change even in the most painful and in the most grievous times of life. Forgive us for turning our hearts away from you and for blaming you for what the enemy and for what people have chosen to do to us. Forgive us and wash us in your blood. We pull up every unrighteous seed of doubt sown by demons and we ask that the fire of God would burn them up and would destroy them, that they would no longer grow in us. We speak fire. I speak fire on every branch and every fruit that has grown from these unrighteous seeds. And I ask you, Lord, to purify our hearts. Cause your fire to purify our hearts and set us on fire for you again. Break up the stony ground and sow righteous seeds that cause us to grow deep roots in you. Roots of trust, roots of faith, roots of relationship. Let us yearn to have a new relationship with you, no matter how long we walk with you. Roots that are anchored in your word and in the knowledge of who you are in the face of any circumstance. Thank you for speaking and calling us to know and to feel your grief. Allow us to feel your grief about this matter that we have had an ought against you. Forgive us for holding an ought against you, for holding an offense against you. We repent now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, this is heavy. It is heavy. It is, it is uh, something that the Lord truly wants to deal with us about. And next week, we're going to continue this discussion about suffering. I wanted to, again, lay some groundwork. 
but we will continue this topic and we'll delve into the fact that um, suffering or persecution is inevitable. I touched on it a little today, but we are to expect trouble. We are in a fallen world and trouble, suffering is expected. There's so much here to impact, so much to discuss. Um, I am ready to go on this journey with you guys and to hear the heart of the Father concerning this. I'm ready. And I pray that you are, are ready to go with, with me. But if you don't, I'm going to talk about it anyway because it's what's on the Father's heart. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you, uh, I'm going to open it up. If you have any topics that you want to talk about, that you want to know about, um, we can take those to the Lord. We can take those to, to Holy Spirit and he can search out those answers for us. Give us those answers. Send them to me and we will talk about them. Okay. Blessings. I pray blessings over you. I pray that this word sits very, very heavy on you. Very, very heavy on you. Heavy on you. And that the Lord begins to show you and reveal to you what I feel and what I've been hearing. His heart on the matter. Um, I pray that you have an amazing week. Thank you for joining this series. Blessings. Have the rest of an amazing Sunday. Um, and join me next week as we talk about the suffering servant. We'll look at the suffering servant so that we can be an effective suffering servant. Be blessed.